On This Week in Enterprise Tech, Microsoft is protecting your data in the fatherland, Amazon is leaving the cloud, and everything you need to know about Enterprise Connect 2016. Twyat on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, Episode 181, recorded March 18th, 2016. Enterprise Connect 2016. This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your house. Right now, get free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash enterprise. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100 plus job sites, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter with a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash twiet. And by Igloo Software. Igloo is an intranet you'll actually like. It connects people with the information they need to do their best work. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit or sign up for a live demo to see it in action. Welcome to Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, it's the show dedicated to the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how the world is connected. I'm your host, Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, your guide to all things in the enterprise. And I'm joined by two of my uh, favorite people in the world, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin from Information Week Radio. Curtis, it's so good to see you after our visit to Orlando not too long ago. Padre, it's great to see you as well. Of course, uh, getting together in Orlando or anywhere is a, always a good thing, but it's nice to be back at home in the swamp. Indeed, and it's nice to have you back on the show. Also joining us is Mr. Lou Maresca. He is a senior lead at Microsoft, specifically in their Dynamics department, which is fantastically profitable. Lou, it's good to have you on, my friend. Uh, is, is, is the baby still keeping you up? Yeah, absolutely. All the time. Good. That's and by the way, CRM is profitable because of this guy. <laughs> He's kind of a big deal, folks. Take a look at him. He's Lou Maresca. Just, just know that. Uh, on a serious note, uh, Ryan was supposed to be on today's episode. He had to deal with a building exploding on the campus of the University of Hawaii. One researcher was actually seriously injured, uh, and he's helping them to recover from the aftermath. So if uh, you see him on the interwebs, tell him he's doing a good thing. Uh, gentlemen, in his honor, let's go ahead and jump straight into the blips. This first one is all about Atlanta customers getting... Gigi, specifically, do you live in Atlanta? Are you served by Comcast? Do you long for faster uploads and obscene download speeds? Well, if so, rejoice, because Comcast has announced that Atlanta will be the first market to have access to Comcast's new gigabit internet services. The service will provide one or two gigabit service without caps, depending on market. The data coming out of Comcast is, well, a little incomplete, with no definitive mention of synchronous speeds or the ability to offer services through your gigabit plus pipe. Additionally, the official Comcast website suggests that pricing will be $140 a month for gig and $300 a month for 2 gig, but there are a few Atlanta area agencies reporting promotional pricing of $70 a month plus a $10 modem rental. Whatever the case, this is an interesting development in the Google-sparked arms race for ever faster internet speeds because Comcast, unlike Google or AT&T, can run the new service over their existing infrastructure without the need to lay new fiber. Not bad for a company whose CEO just two years ago said customers don't want or need faster internet. SAP finally connects HANA to Hadoop and Spark. This week, SAP made good on a promise from Sapphire 2015 to link traditional enterprise business intelligence tools to big data stored in Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark. The promise fulfillment came in the general availability of SAP HANA Vora, an in-memory query engine that enables contextual analytics across all data stored in Hadoop, enterprise systems, and other distributed data sources. Now, there's already a customer 
CenterPoint Energy's Houston Electric worked with SAP to create a testing environment that processed over 5 billion records of data with Hadoop, SAP HANA, and SAP HANA Vora. SAP is serious about the IoT and big data and very serious about bringing them together through their big in-memory engine. The FBI is warning drivers about possible exploits. Based on a new public announcement on March 17th from the Department of Transportation and National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, the FBI released a statement that states that consumers should, quote, watch out for hackers trying to break into your car. With the increasing usage of connected vehicles and autonomous systems, several government branches are attempting to raise additional awareness with the public and manufacturers. As you know, last July, Chrysler recalled 1.3 million vehicles due to several researchers proving the ability to remotely hijack a Jeep's critical functions. The FBI statements also attempts to bring awareness to consumers around ways to avoid such exploits, like making sure strangers don't actually have physical access to your car's vital functions and uh, and the electronics, uh, similar to like leaving your PC unlocked in public coffee shop. They also state that each consumer should ensure they check on software updates for cars when they require manual security patches. There also is an increased risk due to aftermarket devices now being used on vehicles to help track health or other vital functions of these vehicles. Vehicle cybersecurity due to the danger of bodily harm has become an escalated threat and will continue to do so if car manufacturers don't drastically take measures to secure their vehicles. Are you a Windows Phone user? Are you afraid that Microsoft is going to try the same aggressive, will give you Windows 10 or give you Windows 10 tactic that has become oh so popular on the desktop? Well, you can breathe easy. For now, Microsoft has confirmed that Windows Phone users will be able to opt out of the upgrade forever. At the moment, interested users need to download an upgrade advisor to trigger the Windows 10 download, which means that the only people who will receive the upgrade are those who actually want it. Furthermore, Microsoft announced that Windows Phone users may receive notifications in the future about Windows 10, but there will be no push to upgrade unless, of course, the user actually wants the upgrade. Microsoft could always change course on this policy, but it's important to note that most polled Windows Phone users actually want the upgrade to 10 on mobile. So Windows desktop users who don't want 10 are being force-fed, while starving Windows Phone users desperate for the new OS are being invited to an optional upgrade brunch. <sighs> I'm confused. Remember coopetition? Apple partially switches from AWS to the Google Cloud. According to reports, Apple is turning to rival Google to host some of its iCloud business on the Google Cloud platform as it expands its own multi-billion dollar data center infrastructure. Apple reportedly struck a $400 to $600 million deal with Google around the end of last year in which it will move a portion of its iCloud business from Amazon Web Services to the Google Cloud. Apple's decision to add the Google Cloud platform comes as it diversifies its Internet services, which includes its iCloud offering. Apple may ultimately bring more of its iCloud services in-house as it plans to add three more data centers to the four it currently operates in the next two years, according to the Financial Times. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley is estimating that Apple shares, shells out roughly $1 billion annually to AWS. In other news, Nissan shuts down Nissan Connect EV app due to an exploit. As you know, Nissan Connect allows for remote start and other features on vehicles from consumers from the internet. Hacking enthusiast and security consultant Troy Hunt reported to the world that the Nissan Leaf electric car featured a software vulnerability that could allow for outside individuals to take control of certain car vehicle functions. During a hacking workshop led by Hunt, who is a Leaf owner, discovered they were able to use the Nissan Connect EV app to control not just aspects of their own vehicle remotely, but also those of Leaf owners simply by swapping in their vehicle VIN number. Such access enabled climate control systems to be turned on and off and charge state to be accessed um, and with no authentication security required other than the VIN itself. Each of the exploits in the Nissan Connect EV app and Nissan Leaf vehicles were accessible over the internet, sur surfacing the vulnerability of attacks globally. Hunt contacted Nissan first, waiting about four weeks before making his findings public. Nissan responded by taking the app offline until corrections can happen on the software package. Nissan Connect might be offline, but there's actually still a vulnerability in the Leaf API that checks the status of vehicles by VIN numbers by way of a Canadian HTTP GET exploit that makes the use of some the same type of non-authenticating connection between remote users and vehicle systems. The company is also still operating its web portal for users who want to check on the status of the vehicles remotely. Digital hell hath no fury. 
like a multinational conglomerate, conglomerate scorned in a move that is completely, totally, absolutely not connected to the U.S. government overreach into fruit-themed digital data without clear legal oversight. Microsoft has expanded Azure into a number of new offerings, including Azure Deutschland. While pushing into new, new markets is not new and not all that newsworthy, what is interesting is that Azure Deutschland will be run by data trustee Deutsche Telekom and will offer the protection of having all cloud-based data for a participating client stored on German soil. That means no access to the data but by anybody but the client, not even Microsoft. Azure Deutschland has been constructed so that backups, transfers, disaster recovery, and high availability features will never let a bit stray into any adjoining Azure service on foreign soil. And Deutsche Telekom has instituted strict protocols that ensure, quote, Microsoft has in this new model no rights at all to access customer data. Only for special purpose like a support call from a customer, a temporary access will be granted by the data trustee to the Microsoft engineer and only for the specified area. After that time, using a technology similar to what you might know as JIT, all access is revoked automatically, unquote. In other words, Microsoft can't be compelled to grant access to data that it itself has no access to without the data trustee. While this isn't the end-all solution, since the data is still on the soil of a sovereign government, it will be interesting to see if more cloud providers start to take proactive stances against the Apple effect. That does it for the blips. Next up, we're going to be jumping into the bite. Specifically, are we outgrowing the cloud? But before we do that, let's go ahead and take a moment to thank the first sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And it's, well, it's one that I really personally love. Folks may know what this is. It's the Ring Video Doorbell. And inside this box, you're going to have everything that you need to be up and running in just a moment. It's got the tools. It's got the level. It's got the USB charging port. And, of course... It has the Ring Video Doorbell. Now, like the name might uh, suggest, it replaces your current doorbell, but it adds a camera, a high-definition camera, motion sensors, and an audio sensor so that you can hear and speak to someone who may come to the door. They push the bell, and not only do you get a pleasant tone inside the house, but you'll also get a notification on your phone or your tablet that someone is ready for, uh, for a little bit of a talk from your caller ID. Now, here's how it actually works. This is the Ring Video Doorbell that I have set up for my parents in Las Vegas. These are all instances of someone coming up to the door, up to the foyer, and either pushing the button or triggering the motion detection. So I know that right now, this morning, at uh, or yesterday at 6.53 p.m., there was a group of people who were leaving my parents' home, and I have video that I can download. But it's not just friends and family who come by. It's the UPS delivery guy. It's the next-door neighbor who tries to steal power. It's the, the weird pickup truck that we found across the street that was following the UPS van and picking up packages from our neighbors. Folks, this is what the Ring Video Doorbell does. It gives you clear insight into what's happening at your home even when you're not at home. Why not try the product, the gadget, that both Time Magazine and USA Today named as one of their top ten? Go to ring.com slash enterprise for free expedited shipping and to try the Ring Video Doorbell today. That's ring.com slash enterprise. Ring.com slash enterprise. With Ring, you're always home. And we thank Ring for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, gentlemen, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the cloud. Now, the promise of the cloud for startups to full-size enterprises has been pretty clear over the last few years. The ability to instantly have a fault-tolerant, high-availability network that can be resized dynamically is incredibly attractive. Also, the idea that somebody else will take care of all the maintenance and service issues is incredibly attractive to, to IT managers. But is there a time when a business outgrows that promise of the cloud? That's exactly what's happening at Dropbox right now. Well, 500 million people use Dropbox, and Dropbox has pushed onto the consumer desktop, and this past year, they've made a big play for the business and the enterprise desktop. They're known for being fast, reliably, reliable, and fantastically easy to use, but for the eight years since its inception, Dropbox has been living in the Amazon cloud. In fact, they were the darling of the Amazon cloud. It was that promise that you could take an idea, just an idea and a business plan, and instantly turn it into something huge, something that required a massive amount of infrastructure outlay without actually having to do a massive amount of infrastructure outlay. Let me, before we go into dis discussing exactly what's happening with Dropbox, uh, let me throw to you first, Lou. Uh, Dropbox was one of the, the early adopters of the cloud promise, and they've, they've really made good on it. Uh, 
I mean, when you when you think of companies and startups that have used the cloud efficiently, where does Dropbox rank? You know, I think they're one. Of, I mean, they're a pretty high competitor of, uh, of you know all the other systems. I mean, I, like Amazon's, um, and Amazon has one obviously, and my, Microsoft has Blood Storage and Azure and so, you know One Storage and all this one and all these other places, right? So I think they're one of the early adapters, and they and they like you said, they used they used that Amazon S3 from the beginning. Uh, for their storage, and I, I don't necessarily think their growth. Um, I don't think they're moving off of it due to potential growth. I think they're gro they're moving off of it to to have more control over the stack. I think that that's one of the reasons, and I, I kind of get it from that sense because you have more manageable ability when you own the hardware and the data centers and so on and so forth. So I kind of get it when it comes to 500 million users. Um, but again, you know, it could be a cost effective too to, to depending on that scale uh, to own the to own the infrastructure yourself. Right, right. And, and actually, uh, let's talk a little bit about that that cost efficiency because yes, they they do own the full stack or they will own the full stack once they're done with the transfer. But uh, uh, Curtis, one of the things that's been, that has been brought up is that even though the promise of the cloud is fantastic, the ability to stand up a business almost instantly is is wonderful. We like that idea that you will never get the margins down to where you want them to be because there's always going to be a little bit of profit that the cloud provider is going to take. Is this, is this a mark that more and more startups that, that focus, that use AWS or use uh, Azure or use Google's web services are going to start to run into as they grow larger and larger? I strongly suspect that this is one of those deals where there are some intersecting curves that are at work and the precise point at which they intersect is going to vary from company to company but basically you have the cost of maintaining an infrastructure to to provide a, we'll call that a cloud service and then you have the cost of paying someone else to maintain that infrastructure when you're very small and starting obviously using someone else's service buys you tons in terms of not having to spend capital. But as you go forward, as you point out, there, there's a point at which the money that you spend on those services is such that, that buying your own could become less expensive. And, and those curves will cross for many companies. Now, I think it's worthwhile noting that, as in one of uh, my blips, there are exceptionally large companies that still buy cloud storage services, Apple being a prime example. So there are a lot of complicated things here, and I don't think it's possible to, to set a hard and fast rule. But I think we are going to see some of the more successful companies that are built on a cloud basis looking very hard at whether those curves have crossed in their case so that they're better off actually moving to build their own infrastructure, set up their own data centers, and control their own destiny. Now, over the past 30 months, Dropbox has been building its own global network at parallel to the network that they have on AWS. They're using custom hardware, custom software. They even created their own programming language that their engineers have put into place in order to to deal specifically with Dropbox related issues. Now, as of this week, over 90% of their store files are on this new network. They've moved them off of AWS, and uh, by the end of 2016, they will be completely off. There won't even be a residual piece left on AWS, and they can cancel all those accounts. Lou, let me throw over to you, because something that Curtis mentioned, this idea of when a company is ready to come off of the, the, the public cloud, when they're ready to create their own cloud, I'm with Curtis. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule, but you've got a company like Dropbox, which lives in the cloud, coming off of a public cloud. You've got a company like Apple, which doesn't seem to be making any move to come off the public cloud. They're perfectly happy with having that piece being serviced by another, by a third party. Where do you see the division? When, when does it make sense to build your own and when does it make sense to pay the little bit extra in order to get that, that third party support? So I'm in the camp of believers that says if you're a startup and you want to have a low bootstrapping cost to your business when it comes to storing things in the cloud, it, it's always good to start with the cloud. There's there's things like, you know, Microsoft has BizSpark where they give you a million dollars worth of assets for free over a period of a year. 
um, to be able to store stuff in Azure, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm sure Amazon has something similar. So I mean, bootstrapping your business, whether it comes to startup with low startup costs by using these services are helpful. It's usually you'll start to see like, for instance, Apple is a hybrid environment. So like Apple will store specific contents of their cloud services in, uh, you know, potentially AWS, and they might store other things on their local uh, or their own topology, right? So I think that there's a lot of networks like that. And that's how Dropbox was. They started out solely on S3. And as they grew, they wanted to secure particular components, like for instance, metadata around the files and users they wanted to store on their own topology. And so they hosted that in their own data centers. With, but with just the actual file contents themselves, the encrypted file contents or the non-encrypted file contents were still stored on S3 until they've kind of moved to this other way. So when do you kind of move from one to the other? It really all depends. There's companies like, I think there's a company called Aptio where they handle your finances around your IT business and you know when when is it more cost effective to move off of a cloud service that's costing you X dollars per month and move to your own topology where you have your on-premise type devices uh, and and hardware uh, you know when when when, did, when does when do you hit that point right and so they have ways to project out that information and that data uh, whether you outgrow a cloud service or not. And I think maybe Dropbox might be there. I'm not sure if they're really giving that reason as, hey, we've grown, outgrown the service. I don't think you can really outgrow a cloud service in that sense because most of these are elastic in that sense. So it's really all depend on cost effectiveness and whether it's more cost effective to stay on or do a hybrid and or pull it all back onto your own data center. Right. Well, let's go over some of the numbers because the numbers are a little bit of illuminating in this case. According to Forrester, Cloud computing will be a $191 billion market by 2020. Also, according to Forrester, AWS accounted for $2.41 billion in quarter four uh, and almost $10 billion in annualized sales for all of 2015. Now, Microsoft and Google are both challenging. In fact, Microsoft may have a, uh, a sales effort that, that parallels um, Amazon, which is amazing since Microsoft really only got into this game in the last five years or so. So... My question to the two of you is, as we start to see this pie being divided up, uh, even though it's going to be a fantastically huge pie, and as we see some of the veterans like Microsoft really get hit the ground running, are we going to start to see a flight from the major cloud providers? I mean, that's not too, too big of a problem for, for Microsoft because one of the biggest customers of Azure is Microsoft. I mean, all their services run off of Azure. But for a company like Google or a company like Amazon, where they've built out these massive infrastructures, thinking that companies are going to go to them for cloud compute, is, is this going to be a bust uh, right after the boom? Uh, let's start with you, Curtis. Well, a bust indicates that there, there's a drop off in the clients, the, the customers. And I don't think that's where we're going. I think what we are going to see is more a, a real shakeout in terms of which of these competitors have developed rational, workable business models. That's what we don't know yet. Uh, the, the, the idea that you can lose money on every customer but make it up in volume is something that has never worked really well. And... Um, we're going to see if it works here. You know, I, I would remind people that all it takes for a shaky business model is a small blip. Um, look for those of our, our listeners and viewers who are old enough at Eastern Airlines. At one time, one of the premier airlines in the nation, it took a strike of, from machinists that cut off its cash flow for about five days to drive it into bankruptcy and out of existence because it had been losing money for decades, but it was living on cash flow. We're going to see some of these competitors who are in a similar position when they run out of the cash, that's when there's a problem. For the segment as a whole, though, I think it's going to be survival of the fittest and growth of the strongest. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, Lou, it's interesting because in a lot of ways, this does parallel the start of the Internet as we know it. Um, you know, CompuServe was based off of H&R Block's excess computing power. Uh, that's kind of what AWS came out of. Amazon was building up this huge infrastructure, and they decided to open it up and, and perhaps add a couple of extra racks, and it became a thing 
that was then copied by Google and copied by, well, not copied by Microsoft, but was developed in parallel with Microsoft. Where do you see this leading? Because obviously the internet is still around and obviously cloud will still exist. And obviously there will still be businesses who decide that they want a third party to take care of that part of their infrastructure. But as we start to see a winnowing and some of the larger players perhaps moving off of public cloud, what opportunities does that open up for the rest of us? You know, cloud computing, I mean, any type of computing is heterogeneous. I mean, there's worlds where you might be able to bring things in house like Dropbox is doing around storage of files and so on. But there's other things that you can take advantage of around when it comes to cloud storage that you can utilize, for instance, you know, um, actually, you know, calculation, right? I mean, being able to calculate in a cloud elastic service in a way on big data is is actually sometimes even easier in a cloud service versus an on-premise solution. So I think, you know, and Google's proved this with search and so on. So I think, you know, these types of things, I don't think, I think the, I think just the the surface of this is changing. I don't think the the market is changing really in that aspect. Different enterprise businesses, small businesses, even consumers are just having different needs for themselves going forward. And these different needs can be met by new cloud offerings. And I think, you know, as the topology changes in the world, so will the cloud services. So the different offerings, like for instance, a lot of these machine learning uh, uh, services are now coming up where you're, you're providing a data source, whatever. It could be your on-premise data source. It could be, you know, Amazon's data, S3s or, Amaz or even uh, Azure's blob storage or so on. And you're providing this data to this service that's doing the calculations for you. So I think, you know, these types of things are, will change as consumers' needs change. And I think, I don't think they're going out of style in that sense. I think the market will just change with the needs. So I think as it goes forward, you might see these businesses that are large that move to their on-premise solution. And that's because, it's, again, it's more cost-effective economically for them. But I don't think that they'll fully move off of the need for cloud services that are offered by other businesses. Good point. Well, gentlemen, we're not done with this discussion because guess what? Next week, we're going to be having Thomas Hansen. He's the global VP of sales of Dropbox on the show. So uh, we'll be talking a bit more about this next week. But let's move on right now because it's time to move to the special segment we're having for this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, where Curtis and I are going to be talking a little bit about Enterprise Connect. Specifically, it's the conference in Orlando, Florida that the both of us were at dealing with unified communications. And uh, there were a few interesting twists to this year's conference. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech. And I'm going to start by asking you a question. Do you own your own business? Or if you don't own your own business, are you responsible for the hiring of new talent for your business? Because if you are, and if you do, you understand that the people that you hire, the talent that you bring in, the inspiration that you gather together is going to be responsible for the success or failure of your business. You simply can't have a good business. You can't have a successful enterprise unless you have the talent and the skill, which is why we're so happy that ZipRecruiter is a sponsor of the Twyet Riot. They understand that posting jobs in one place isn't enough to find those quality candidates that, that you need. And they know that short staffing leaves little time to post to dozens of job sites. But thanks to ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 100-plus job sites with a single click and be instantly matched to candidates from over 6 million resumes. But don't listen to me. Listen to Dan. He's a real ZipRecruiter client who wrote, quote, The hardest part about running a business when you need to hire is that you have to spend extra time recruiting while you're short-staffed. But with ZipRecruiter, I've gotten quality candidates within 24 hours of posting a job. ZipRecruiter's website makes this process so much faster by letting me manage candidates in one place. Just post once and within 24 hours, you can watch your candidates roll in to ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use interface. They've been used by over 400,000 businesses, and you can try it now for free. Getting the right people for your company is so important. Do you really want to leave it up to chance? Today, you can try ZipRecruiter for free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Twyet. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash T-W-I-E-T. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of this week in Enterprise Tech. Well, before we uh, jump into a little video that I recorded at uh, Enterprise Connect, Curtis, can you describe to the folks what, what is Enterprise Connect? Why is it that the two of us make that pilgrimage to Orlando every year for uh, something that is a very specific, very, very particular piece of enterprise technology? 
Well, Enterprise Connect is a conference that began many years ago when everyone was still talking about computer telephony. Uh, back in the time when VoIP phones were the newest thing, it was the chance for companies and engineers to come together to talk about what was there. Over the years, we've seen it evolve to become a conference about all of the ways in which we communicate and collaborate through the computers on our desktops, on our laptops, and increasingly in the palms of our hand. And so that's really why we go and a lot of other people go, because for many, many computer users, that communication and collaboration has become the most important use of the device. That doesn't seem like it's going to go away, away anytime soon. And uh, I think we're going to have stuff to talk about from Enterprise Connect for this year and many years to come. I'm so glad that you uh, you traced it back to the emergence of the original VoIP phones, the SIP phones that, oh, we all love and, and know and probably have somewhere in a storage closet. Uh, we will be talking. I'm, I, I want to get your take because while I was busy interviewing, you actually had the chance to roam the floor, to speak to the vendors, to find what was new, what was interesting. But before we do that, let's go ahead and jump to the No Jitter booth at Enterprise Connect 2016 where uh, I had a chance to interview a very interesting man from Cisco. I'm Father Robert Ballasser, the digital Jesuit host of This Week in Enterprise Tech on the Twit TV network. I'm here in Orlando, Florida for Enterprise Connect 2016 and I've got a special treat for you. I'm sitting next to Mr. Jonathan Rosenberg. He is the Vice President and the CTO of the Collaborations Technology Group at Cisco. That's right. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Now, we don't have to do that part of the interview where you introduce your company. I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure everyone Cisco. knows. No, yeah. no, we make toilet paper. You've probably seen our trucks Even driving food around. Supplies, food right? supply and yeah. services. <laughs> No, no, the other one, the one with the, the C. Yes, the, the, yeah, the, the, the networking. Uh, but it's been a very, well, surprising week for Cisco. You've yeah. had some, some announcements that yep. have people uh, kind of nodding their heads. Can you talk yep. about them? I would be, I would love to talk about them. So the first announcement, which really isn't a huge surprise, but we have announced the general availability now in the U.S. of our new Spark service that's calling, messaging, and meeting. The calling part available in the U.S., the rest of it available everywhere Cisco Spark has been available. This is a huge milestone for us. We announced the capabilities in November, and now, just a few short months later, ready to, ready to sell. So that's probably the big announcement. The second announcement, which I think really is a surprise, probably the big surprise for the show for us, was the uh, developer fund. So, you know, Rowan likes to say we put our money where our mouth is, and he means it. We have put aside $150 million. That's not, Padre, that's not chump change. No, it's not. That's a lot. I don't, it wasn't like he just took out his wallet and put a few 20s down. That's real money uh, for developers that build on top of the Spark platform. And we think this is going to obviously help drive a lot of innovation and really proves how committed we are to APIs and developers. Uh, the other, we had a lot of other announcements too. The one other I would mention, I guess, is that we announced this thing called Presenter Track. It's like super, super cool. And it's a telepresence feature that allows someone to stand at the front of the room and be presenting. And literally, it's like there's a cameraman that's following the person automatically around, but it's completely done in software. And it is amazing and allows you this great remote experience when you have someone like presenting in the front oh, of a room. One of the things I do want to go back to is the, de the developer fund, because I yeah. think you're right. That was a surprise. Yep. And it would be easy to say, oh, it's... It's sort of a, it's a PR stunt. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just a toss away, but $150 million is not a toss away. No, it isn't a toss away. We had to, we had to fight for that money. I mean, tell me, tell me about the strategy there. What, what is the hopes for that $150 million? What do you want it to develop? Or do you even know? Well, I think we're going to see, right? But the core idea we want to do is that, you know, we really committed to an open platform and, and that's all just words. It's just words, Padre, unless there's actually people who are building applications on top of this platform. And when we look at what we think is going to make communications and collaboration successful in this new world order, it's about an ecosystem, right? And, you know, that doesn't come easy. So for us to really make this transition from where Trisco has traditionally been to someone that people like, there's tons and tons and tons like of apps on it, we need, to, we need to put some money to make that happen. And so that's what this is about. That's the strategy. Build the ecosystem that drives value into our platform. Simple as that. All right, Jonathan, I'm, I'm, I got to ask if you could shine some light on this. Yeah. 
there has been a lot of upheaval yep. in this industry over the last yeah. year. There's been this, this huge move, this almost desperate rush for companies to offer all of their solutions to be as a service, yep. that's number one, and yep. two, to be equally good yep. on-prem, off-prem, hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Is, is that the right way to go? Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna, I actually would like to challenge okay. that traditional thing. Yeah. As you hear that from lots of vendors, the story, because that's what customers ask for. What they say is, oh, I, you know, I would like to be able to buy it in the cloud or buy it on the prem, and it's exactly the same thing, right? This way it's just my choice of consumption model. That sounds good, right? It sounds good. But what it misses is that cloud in many ways is fundamentally different. And it provides a bunch of properties that are only possible in the cloud. And so if you build your software in a way that allows it to be the same on-prem as the same in the cloud, then you're by definition missing out on the things that are uniquely cloud. And a lot of these are technical, but they result in real benefits for the customer. Let me give you, Padre, my favorite example. Please. My favorite example is A-B testing. So A-B testing is a, a very common practice for cloud providers, where if they want to know what's the thing that drives the best engagement in user experience, they try something, they give 5% of users option A, they give another 5% option B, and the classic example on the web is like, how, what color should the button be to drive click-through rates? But in collaboration, we worry about things like, how do we make sure users understand how to engage with the feature? Why aren't they completing the call transfer flow? How come they're, you know, do they try and send the message and delete them a lot? Like, what's wrong with that? So we can actually A-B test user experience things like this to actually make the product better in the hands of users. You actually have to build a bunch of stuff in your software to enable that. You know, different builds, different analytics and pipeline. You can't do that on the premise. You cannot, it's like fundamentally infeasible. So if you have a piece of software that's the same in both places, how are you taking advantage of that? My second thing that's big on this is the ability to push new software into production on the servers multiple times a day, to constantly be iterated. And continuous delivery is the secret to great user experience, to quality, to innovation. It's the secret that's been making all these consumer players move really fast and produce great products for users. Right, well, let me tell you, you can't do continuous delivery on-prem. And more importantly, if you want to do continuous delivery in the cloud, you have to build different software for it. Why? Well, you got to upgrade the thing all the time. So like, can you have an outage when you upgrade? No, most premise software, you have to have a maintenance window and upgrades is this whole like weekend long affair for the IT guy. You can't have that. So when we built Cisco Spark for continuous delivery, we upgraded all the time and it's completely hitless. The traditional logic is, well, yeah, of course, I, I want my solution to be flexible. Yeah, it sounds great. But the way that you describe it, it, it sounds more, well, you're getting the worst of yes, both worlds. Exactly. You're getting the, the weakness of premise and cloud. You're getting the least common denominator. And we don't believe in least common denominator. We want awesome. We want awesome. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of wanting awesome, yep. I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball here. Yep. Look forward a year, Enterprise Connect 2017, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe even a couple of years, Enterprise yeah, yeah. Connect 2020. Okay. What are the trends that you're starting to see right now yep. that you think are going to shape who is going to be on this floor? Great question. So, a bunch of trends. We already talked about one of them, move to cloud, not new. I think it's the pace is picking up. It's accelerating. So, I think in 2020, everyone's going to be here and that's like, you're not even going to talk about cloud anymore. That's like not going to be the big thing. That's like, yeah, of course it's cloud solution. Uh, so that's one thing that's going to be, uh, be much different. The second thing I think is different is we're seeing a, another transition which is how people think about this market. Like traditionally it's been very segmented. You've had video conferencing vendors, you have audio conferencing vendors, you have UC vendors, you have phone vendors, you have, and there's like these little silos of products that the enterprise actually traditionally bought sort of best of breed and then stitched the whole thing together and has started to notice that you don't get the optimal user experience when you do that. So the trend we're seeing, especially as people move to the cloud, is people are moving towards a more integrated experience. And so this is what we're doing with Cisco Spark. It's designed so that you can't even, like calling, messaging, and meeting is part of what it does, but like we want to get it to the point where you can't even tell where one of those ends and the other begins. It's just one thing, you get Spark. And others are doing some of this too. We think we're ahead. But you know, Microsoft is doing this, they're offering a broad portfolio. You're seeing all the, even the guys who just used to do UC, uh, now they're picking up messaging companies and meeting companies like Fuse is another good example of that. They're trying to build a thing. Now they're sort of you know, trying to cobble it together. We've actually done it from scratch. So I think the trend you'll see is these micro niche providers have faded away and it's all about who can provide a collaboration solution that makes it easy for people to work. That's what you actually want to buy. Not I want to buy a video telepresence employee. Would it be fair to say that uh, you expect at some point in the near future yeah. 
uh, you'll no longer be able to tell the difference between your unified communication solution and your productivity suite and your network suite and your network applications, but the, the providers that survive will be the ones that give you Can sort of that all, all in one. I think so, that's exactly what I'm saying. We have been speaking with Jonathan Rosenberg. He is the CTO and the Collaboration Technology Group at uh, Cisco. Uh, thank you so very much for spending your time with us. Th My thank pleasure. you for sharing these insights. My I think uh, it be very valuable to our listeners. Now, if they wanted to find out more about what you do with the yeah. Collaboration Group, yeah. if they want to find out more about what you presented yeah, here yeah. at Cisco, yeah. where can they go? Well, for Cisco Spark, guess where you go? www.ciscospark.com and of course, cisco.com with a C-I-S-C-O for everything else. All right, thank you so much. Jonathan, an absolute pleasure. And folks, stay tabbed because we've got more coming from Enterprise Connect. Okay, he was very excitable, so you're going to have to forgive him all the buzzwords. I know, I know that got a little PR crazy for a second there, but... The Cisco booth actually was one of my favorite stops at Enterprise Connect. It was it was a fantastic place to to look at where uh, Cisco was going in terms of opening up some of their, their infrastructure, their architecture. Uh, uh, Curtis, before before we go in, because we're we're, we're going to do one more ad here, but did you happen to, to stop by the Cisco booth at all? I stopped by briefly. It's one of those things where you you kind of have to. Uh, divide y your time, but I did stop by. I got a couple of press releases from them. Uh, you know, they really are, as you said, excited and, and very serious about this part of the market. It's been very interesting to see Cisco moving more and more from simply being a company that's interested in providing layer one and two to, to really wanting to support what's happening up uh, in layer five, six, seven of the uh, ISO stack. Exactly, and and that's that was sort of my take on it. I mean, yes, get get past the, the buzzwords because I know that that interview was very buzzworthy, but the substance was there. The new technology that they showed off doesn't just look glitzy. It's not just blinky and, and wonderful to have, but the fact that they want to open up the infrastructure a little bit to make it possible for developers to come in and 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 make it flexible enough to work inside of a particular enterprise. That's got me excited. Now, we're going to talk more about Enterprise Connect, and specifically, we're going to be bringing Curtis Franklin and his expertise from the floor into the show. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the sponsor of this episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and it's Igloo Software. Now, do you remember the first time your company had an intranet? It was probably sexy, right? It was way back then that was attractive. The idea of having something that was like the internet, but it had all the information and all the processes that you needed to work inside of your enterprise. Well, these days, that intranet is probably looking a little dated, probably a little less new, a little less unique, a little less special, which is why we're happy to have Igloo as a supporter of the Twiat Riot, because Igloo is an intranet that you'll actually like. It's a cloud portal that enables you to share files, collaborate on documents, blog updates, coordinate calendars, and manage projects all from the same attractive and intuitive interface. Now, they leverage the best part of the intranet, important enterprise-specific data at your fingertips, and what people have come to expect from Internet Social. They give your users comments, like buttons, and the ability to add content based on permissions with drag-and-drop widgets and a WYSIWYG editor. Of course, a beautiful and intuitive interface isn't very useful or very beautiful if your users can't access it on the devices that they're using. That's why Igloo is built with responsive design that automatically reformats to your phone or your tablet. Igloo is also customizable. SharePoint, Salesforce, Active Directory, and soon, Dropbox and Box. All of them can live inside of your Igloo, branded with your look and feel, accessible on all of your devices, so that it doesn't feel as if you're hopping on and off your network in order to get to all the files and services that you need. Now, what about security? Security is a big concern. Well, they got that covered. SSL and 256-bit encryption baked into a variety of access, authentication, and identity services to ensure that only your authorized users have access to what they're supposed to have. They also offer you plans starting as low as $3 per user per month. And unlike other solutions, you get full access to Igloo's entire suite of tools, all for one low price. No nickel and diming you as you need more and more features as you move on in your Igloo. Volume pricing is available, and it's used by government agencies and companies like Hulu, Inventive Health, American Family Insurance, and, I and Ipswich. Why not? Why not try the service that they all know and love? Sign up now. Try it for free at igloosoftware.com slash twit. That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. And when you sign up through our link, you can get your own igloo for up to 10 people absolutely free. 
for as long as you want. That's igloosoftware.com slash twit. And we thank them for their support of this week in enterprise tech. Well, Curtis, this is the time where uh, we would normally have a guest. We would bring him or her in to talk about uh, something that's happening in the IT world. But I am more interested in finding out what you found while I was uh, cemented to the no jitter booth. What would be the number one thing, the, the thing that most impressed you from Enterprise Connect 2016? Interestingly enough, the thing that most impressed me is, is a trend rather than a product. And that trend is what I'm going to call the transition from product to framework. Uh, another way to phrase it might be the possible disappearance of unified communication. Now, I want to be careful here because I don't think that this connection and, and this group of communications capabilities, the voice, video, texting, and, and sharing desktops, is going to go away. But what an increasing number of companies and engineers were talking about is the way that those functions are being swallowed up in other applications. It seems like the new generation of office workers, those that are, say, 30 or 35 and younger, don't want to get out of an application they're working in to go launch something else in which to communicate. If they're working in a document, they just want to click a button and be communicating with their coworkers. Think of it as the Googlefication of communications, and I think you're, you're really on the right track. Googlefication, I like that. You know, uh, one of the other trends that I started seeing at Enterprise Connect, and I want to tie this in with your your uh, your idea of the disappearance of unified communications, is especially over the last, I'd say, eighteen months, as we've seen manufacturers rush to be able to offer their solutions, both in the cloud, on premise, and hybrid, a combination of the two. We've seen them also wrap up unified communications in standard productivity suites. So the, it's they're trying to eliminate that barrier. You don't have your unification UC tools and your productivity tools. They should be together. Your UC tools should be productivity tools, and your productivity tools should incorporate some form of UC. Um, was there a, was there a vendor who you thought exemplified that more than any of the others? Well. Um... I have to say one of the things, and this, this surprises me to a certain extent, but the leader in this particular trend has to be Google. And the thing that surprises me is the extent to which Google for work is being embraced by larger and larger enterprises. Um, you know, for a decade or more, we've been used to thinking of Google as something that you and your kids might use, that they, you know it's fine if they use it for their schoolwork, but it's not a serious tool. And what we're seeing is more and more companies saying, you know what, the productivity pieces are serious enough and the communications are robust enough that this is the direction we want to go. The piece that makes it especially alluring to a lot of those companies is the fact that they do have both the iOS and Android off um, mobile apps so that their employees can have essentially the same interface and experience, whether they're working on a, a laptop computer in the office or a mobile phone at lunch. Uh, Curtis, we, we actually have a, a question in the chat room from Specs. Uh, he, he actually wants to know what is unified communications. We say unified communications all the time, and, and we talk to people who we assume know what we're talking about. But when you think of UC, what's included, what's not included? How, how would you differentiate UC from just the standard communications tools that we used before UC became a buzzword? Well, let, let's go back to the history. You talked about uh, when we started going to Enterprise Connect, it was about SIP phones. So when SIP phones were, were the first big thing, you would have your, your voice on your desk through a, a standard SIP phone instrument. But if you wanted to do a video call, you would get up and you would go to a video call conference room where there would be this six-figure system ready to make a, uh, a video call 
to another six-figure video system from the same company. Um, text messaging, well, it happened through, say, um, AOL's Instant Messenger or something like that. But again, all of these were separate from different companies, different clients. The idea of unified communications was that all of these could be brought together in a single client. Um, we saw some very early models that were, in fact, desktop units that were their own thing. Um, but they really happened when the soft phone started happening on laptop computers um, and desktop computers, to be honest, because there you could have voice and video and text all in one client. And that was the unified communications. Now, since that happened, we started seeing things added, things like desktop sharing and whiteboarding and things of that nature. But the idea ultimately is that all of these happen in one unified client with one single experience rather than sending the user off to do different kinds of communicating in different in different clients. I, Lou, I want to bring you in here because listening to Curtis, it made me realize that, yeah, it wasn't all that long ago that UC was a room in the building. It was a room in the office. So you did your regular work, but then you had to have a conference call. You got up, you went to the floor that had the big UC setup that was very expensive. Most of the time in six figures, sometimes in seven figures, if you were in a, a big enough enterprise that had crazy cameras and a wonderful setup from one of the, the, the premier names of uh, Unified Communications, and it would do a two, three, four-way communication setup with branch offices around the world. That's what the early idea of communications was. And now we're in a place where if, if you talk to someone who has just entered to the enterprise and you tell them that UC is something they had to do away from their desk, they would kind of, they would scratch their head and look at us and say, no, 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 UC is, is on my desktop. Have you seen that change much at Microsoft? Because, I mean, of course, Microsoft had some of the very early UC tools, and they're still very much involved in UC today. How has that progressed on the campus? So I think, you know, like you said, appliances for UC have always been expensive and always been kind of, you know, hard to take care of and so on for businesses. So I think, yeah, that's where the convergence and the um, the where the CPaaS or you know, communication platform as a service has kind of come out of things. And I think, you know, Microsoft and pl other players in the group are starting to bring these things to businesses to show that they can integrate on-premise solutions with these cloud platforms uh, that allow them to do easy, ease of use and, and easy meetings and easy collaboration tools uh, by using these services. And so I think that 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 move to the cloud, again, we talked about it before, is, you know, the cloud services will find new ways to service businesses in in their growing needs when the when the environment changes, and I think this is just one of them. They have these old, tired, you know, UC appliances and you, uh, ways of handling things. You know, whether you're you, even if you're a customer service organization that needs to make a lot of call, calls over VoIP solutions and and be able to collaborate with uh, other groups and businesses. You know, these types of things are complex, and to be able to sometimes do it on premise is difficult. So I think that's where kind of the market's slightly going, and you'll see more and more of the CPAS offerings uh, as time goes on. Let's talk about those. Uh, Curtis, UC as a service or everything as a service really hit Enterprise Connect last year uh, where the major manufacturers were demanding, what were demanded of them to, to present their, their solutions that could be run in the cloud because clients were saying, wait a minute, I don't want to in in invest in infrastructure here. I don't want to have to have a crazy six-figure room that I create. I want you to do everything on your end, make it a web client, maybe make it RT a web RTC uh, enabled, and, and we'll go from there. Is that just a given now? Is that table stakes or is that are we still deciding whether or not we want everything you see as a service? I think the answer is we're still deciding, and we're still deciding on some of the same bases that uh, we were talking about back in the Dropbox conversation. Uh, you've got, again, these uh, colliding curves. Now, for, I will say, almost all small to mid-size enterprises, it's going to be easier uh, and probably less expensive to let someone provide your communication services in the cloud. Um, communication services 
require their own special set of expertise. And it's not likely that someone who is uh, a general purpose IT specialist is going to be truly superb at setting up all that needs to be done to make enterprise class video, audio, and um, collaboration happen. When you get above the midsize, then it becomes a different set of issues because you start de uh, dealing with different kinds of networks. Um, it's one thing if you are a company that's small enough to be going out over co what we call a commodity internet, the kind of thing that you might get from a cable company or, or a, a telco through a standard contract. If you are leasing MPLS lines, then the world changes. And at that point, you almost certainly are going to have the kind of expertise where it might make sense to have a combination of on-prem equipment and stuff in the cloud. The thing that uh, companies ha are beginning to realize after, as you said, we had the explosion of communications as a service last year, is that even when the, the servers and the cores are all in someone else's cloud and being managed by them, the network components, and by that I mean the, the provisioned network connections, are complicated if you want the communications to be rock solid and enterprise class. That's especially critical if you're using those communications to, to talk back and forth with your customers. And there are companies right at that dividing line who are looking at the quality issues, the complexity, the management, and saying, you know what? It makes sense to have some of this, some of the critical stuff on-prem, controlled by us. We'll let the other stuff go to the cloud for cost reasons. Lou, we've got a, a, an interesting comment from uh, Ringombing. Ringo Bing. Ringo Bing. He's got an interesting name in the chat room. But his, his point is that UC is still siloed. Uh, as as much as we we push the open standards, we have Comcast, uh, we have Verizon, we have Sprint as ISPs, and actually AT and T as well as ISPs who are trying to push forward sort of UC from the carrier perspective. Uh, we've got Cisco saying that they're opening up their development so that they can have everyone come in and design tools that they need. We've got Microsoft coming in and saying, look, everything is just UC. We still have. The end user who's saying, wait a minute, if I have one tool, I can't speak to someone on another tool. I have to use the same tool that they're using. And therefore, are we just moving the silo from the desktop into the cloud? Yeah, I think so. I think I think what you're saying is, you know, specific businesses, they'll buy into a set of tools and a set of UC uh, infrastructure. And when they do that, they kind of have to use it for multiple aspects. I mean, it was just last year, I think, when Skype now allows intercommunication between its consumer level Skype and its, you know, its link or, or Skype business uh, level uh, services as well. And I think that's really the only synergy I see between services like that. Um, you don't see that coming from you know, these other businesses that offer similar solutions. So when you buy in, yeah, you are kind of Siloing, siloing yourself into that business. Um, and, you know, once you're there, sometimes it's type tough to get off, especially people are used to those tools and those collaboration aspects of it. So I think that's, I, I think that's what businesses want though, right? I mean, I think they want you to put in the initial investment and then once you're in, they, as long as they continue to offer you tools and incremental updates to these things that help your business, they expect you to never get off, hopefully, right? So I think that's kind of what they want. Even unified protocols across these things are not going to be early adapted because of that reason. I think Google might be the one that would start doing that first, and then people would kind of come along thereafter. But when you're talking about separate companies like Cisco and other companies like that, you're going to see more of a siloed effect because it's it's beneficial to their to their business structure. Yeah, silos I don't think are going anywhere in the near future, but... That actually leads into a second story, a second theme that uh, I'd love to get Curtis's input on. Curtis, there was a technology that was supposed to break down silos, and it was introduced two and a half years ago. And it has a lot of promise, but we haven't seen a lot of practical deployments of it, and that was WebRTC. WebRTC was this idea of the cloud will save us. 
cloud-based services will save us. And we will be able to have all of the features that we expect from a unified communication suite, from a productivity slash communication suite with this web-based client, this web-based process. To date, I have not seen a major manufacturer roll out WebRTC in a way that wasn't a test or a proof of concept. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, WebRTC is one of these great technologies that is absolutely lovely in concept. I mean, it it adds a, a video communications capability to a web browser uh, with about half a dozen lines of code. I mean, it, it's just blissfully simple. Um, the, the problem is that WebRTC rests on some things that are still kind of coming together. Uh, one of them is HTML5 standardization across all the browsers. And the other, well, is figuring out how all the backend stuff works. And that's the piece that's been really hard because it's one thing to say, oh, just include half a dozen lines of code and by magic, you have high quality video communications. But as we all know, all of that has to, to go through routers. It has to, to be shaped. It has to be channeled. Lots of things have to happen. And in WebRTC's case, the, there's one more complication because while it's good that it has a standard that eliminates some of the standards mismatch with the required video communication appliance back in the data center, uh, it, for those who don't know, WebRTC has the potential, if it's just two stations communicating, to go direct station to station or client to client without involving anything on the back end at all. That very feature means that it can wreak havoc on an enterprise network if it's done without lots of planning by the network admin. So it's one of those things where, boy, howdy, it sounds great. And one of these days when it's all implemented, it's going to be super cool. But I don't really look for it to be universally adopted. Um, maybe not even in a year where the third digit begins with a one. <laughs> okay. Curtis is giving us the diplomatic reasoning for this. And I, I've, I've used this myself. I said, yeah, I, I see the promise. I, I'd like to see the solution. I'd like to see more companies actually roll out something that looks like a finished product rather than a proof of concept. But, Lou, I'm, I'm going to ask you for straight talk here because this is what you give us on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Yeah. Is Web RTC a bust? So I'll give you one reason, and, I'll, and I have seen this a lot in the enterprise business, is... You know, not that, you know, IE is the best browser in the world, but, you know, IE is 40% market share out there. And when you don't support a browser that's 40% market share uh, without plug-in support, then you're losing a large customer base, especially in enterprise business, which is what hopefully what, what our WebRTC was kind of targeting. So I think that's where it falls short mostly. I think, in you know, you're hitting a browser that most enterprise businesses even you know financial businesses and so on still use because they have a lot of ActiveX controls and plugins that they use in that browser and they're kind of stuck on that uh, without moving to other things like Firefox or Google uh, Chrome. So I think that's where they're at uh, with that. And even even Ad Edge browser doesn't support that capability. So moving off IE is not really an objective for them. Uh, but again, also things like uh, monitoring WebRTC is very tough from an end-to-end -end standpoint. So being able to monitor um, what's going on? Like, like Curtis pointed out, it's a technology that it's hap it works in the browser without a plugin, and, and, and it, it needs to be able to be monitored from all the way across your entire topology. And sometimes that's very difficult because of the way it's constructed and built within the browser itself. So I think uh, it's it it was almost doomed from the beginning in that sense because again, it's it, you try to force it on browsers, and you notice browsers move slow when it comes to adapting new technology and new new infrastructure. So I think. That's that's one of the major pinpoints of it. Another thing too is you'll have other businesses that are coming out with things. I think Cafe X Communications they have something called Chime, which is very similar. It delivers an end-to-end browser-based video capability 
um, which I think it actually was presented at Enterprise Connect. And, you know, they do it better because it's, they, they offer more monitoring tools and they offer more browser support, right? So I think these types of things are pushing WebRTC off the market. So I, th I do think, I do think it's on its downfall. Wow. Okay. Well, that, there we go. There we have it. Uh, I, I, want, I know we're over time, but I want to do one more quick one because I, I want Curtis's input on this. Curtis, there was a third theme that was running through Enterprise Connect that made it even over to the No, no Jitter booth. And that was this, uh, this move to mobile as a service, which sounds weird, but bear with me. You had Comcast, you had Sprint, you had AT&T, you had Verizon all on the floor pushing this idea of why does your employee even need an office? Why does your employee need a desk? We can, we can replicate that experience. We can give them their desktop. We can give them their, their IT-allowed access to files and to resources on the network no matter where they are, through their mobile devices, which, of course, they would supply. And they can also guarantee encryption and the safety of data that's transferring across the network. Did you buy into this, or does it just sound, sound like another way to, to sell ISP services? Is mobile as a service an actual service, or is it just a marketing term? Um, it's interesting because I, I heard that referenced in a slightly different way when uh, a keynote speaker said that the real debate is between mobile first and mobile only. Uh, and obviously the vendors that you're talking about are in the mobile only camp. Here's what I think is interesting. Again, I think that where you're going to see this adopted is some fairly specialized uh, mid-tier companies. I think there will be some divisions and groups within larger companies that adopt it. Um, it's funny because I, I, this makes me especially hate that, that Brian's not here with us because the idea of the desktop as a service is one that he's been talking about through his VDI work for years and years. Most of them aren't really talking about VDI, but they are talking about a set of applications that allow you to have that full in-office productivity experience without needing to go to the office. Um, it's a concept that companies are willing to adopt if their managers can wrap their heads around it. What a lot of companies haven't figured out is how to manage a fully mobile workforce. Um, whether or not it's going to be these big cell data providers the, providing this as a service, I think that's the piece that really remains to be seen. I like it. Well, gentlemen, we're going to have to end it there. I'm sorry we could keep talking because th there were quite a few trends and products that were released at 2016 Enterprise Connect. Uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I want to thank you all for listening to the best dang enterprise podcast in the universe. That's according to nine out of 10 Unified Communication Solutions. I want to thank our, our host, our co-host for being here. I wouldn't want to do the show without them. Let's start with uh, Lou. Lou, where can people find you? Of course, you're at Microsoft. Of course, you work at the fabulously important and profitable Dynamics Group, which is profitable because of you. We know this now. Um, where else can they find your work and uh, what you're doing? Absolutely. You can always find me on uh, Twitter at LouMM. And, of course, you can find all the work that my team and I do on the CRM Dynamics uh, product line at uh, CRM.Dynamics.com. Folks, Mr. Lou Maresca of course, we love having him here on This Week in Enterprise Tech. Over to you, Curtis. What's um, what's new on uh, Information Week Radio? What will you be covering? Who will your guest be? Well, I tell you what, one of the things that we're beginning to do on Information Week Radio, we've sent out the invitations to all of the companies that are the finalists for the Information Week Elite 100. So over the coming weeks, we're going to have a brand new series of radio shows featuring CIOs and top executives from those finalists. This is, of course, all leading up to the Information Week Elite 100 conference, which takes place concurrent with the beginning of Interop in Las Vegas the first week of May. So lots of good stuff coming up there. Hope lots of people will tune in and listen to wisdom from their peers. I will be there. I'll be one of them listening. Again, thank you, uh, you two, for being part of the show. I'm sorry that we didn't have Brian on today, but as we mentioned at the start of the show, he's, he's a little busy right now. He will be back next week, 
as well as for our pre-records coming up this Monday. So we've got a lot of twiet coming in the, in the next week. You may want to stay tabbed. Folks, don't forget that we do this show every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. You can find us at live.twit.tv. If you want to watch the pre-show, the post-show, and everything that comes in between, it's, um, it's kind of fun. It's part of the community, the Twiat Riot, to see what goes on when the cameras aren't really recording. Also, if you're watching live, go ahead and jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. You can be part of the feedback crew. I have a, a screen right there where I, I take questions, I take your comments, and I bring them into the discussion. If you want to be part, a true part of the Twiat Riot, you have to be part of the interactive experience that is Twit. I also want to thank everyone here who makes this show possible, of course, to Carson, my super producer, to Lisa and Leo for letting us do This Week in Enterprise Tech, to you who uh, watch this show each week, and I want to make it easy for you to get our episodes. Please just go to our show page at twit.tv slash twiat. There you'll find a drop-down menu with all of our episodes. You can download our back catalog and see our notes as they, as they come along, as well as subscribe to the show. If you want to support This Week in Enterprise Tech, the best way to do it is to make sure that every episode is automatically downloaded to your device of choice. Do you want the audio version in your phone so you can listen to us on the way to work? You can do that. Do you want the video version on your tablet so that you can watch on your breaks? You can do that. Do you want the high-definition version on your desktop so you can watch us on your big-screen TV when you get home? You can do that. Again, twit.tv slash twiat. Finally, thanks to the man who really puts the show together. He makes everything run. If he pushes the wrong button, we're off the stream and to him, I have, see, Whoops. just like that, I Oops. have so much love. It's Mr. Cranky Hippo, Brian Burnett himself. Uh, Cranky Hippo. What's up? I said all those good things about you. Of course, I didn't really mean them. Because right. I don't know what you do on the Twit Network. Nor will you ever know what I do, apparently. I mean, other than that how-to show that we do uh, twice a week, which is on Thursdays and Mondays, called Know How. We just had an Arduino Wonderland that's coming up in a couple weeks. So if you want to check that out, go to twit.tv slash kh, and also you can follow me on Twitter at cranky underscore hippo. Fantastic. And uh, don't forget that if you follow Cranky Hippo, an angel gets his wings. That's right. Until next time, I'm Father Robert Balasair, the digital Jesuit, reminding you that if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet.